come in and read your word and learn from your word. And Lord, I pray that all of our hearts are open for what you have for us individually. I thank you, Lord, that you are an infinite God, yet an intimate God. You love us, you know us deeper than anyone could. Lord, as we start to study about the heart, I just pray that you will just blow our hearts up with love for you and just walk us through the steps, Lord, if there's things we need to fix, if there's things we need to cut out. But I just pray, Jesus, we always keep our eyes on you. Father, please drive Satan far from here. I pray that you just put him outside the door. And if there are people are burdened today, under attack today, Lord, please let it stop right now so they can focus on your word. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did on that cross. In your precious name, amen. So the study is called Matters of the Heart. Um, I started working on it actually last semester. Last semester was the first break I've taken from teaching in 22 years. But I think you would agree with me, when your children get productive and start popping out grandchildren, you need to be there, okay? It took my sons a long time. So that's why I was off last semester, but I started writing this then and the Lord just kept giving me stuff. So we're gonna talk about matters of the heart. The heart's mentioned almost 900 times in the Bible. Almost 900 times. And think about it. I'm sure as we start to talk about it, verse after verse will just start coming to you. We're told to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Both Old Testament and New. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 5 and 6. And then it's in Matthew 22, 36 to 38. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. We're told to trust God with all of our hearts. We'll be talking about that next week. That's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We're told that God knows the motives of our hearts. That's lesson three. That's uh, Hebrews 4, 12. Uh, we're hitting pride. Uh, and, and please show up anyway. It's worse on me than it is for you when we have to do pride week. Oh my gosh. But we're going to be talking about pride and what that looks like because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's three different times. James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5 and Old Testament Proverbs 4, 24, right around there. I'm getting older, so, or 4.34. I can get you to book and chapter now, but not always verse. But so, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He wants us to have humble hearts before him. The heart's desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand it? That's Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. So then God says, I need to take out this heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's Ezekiel 26, 36. So just look over and over and over the, the heart, the heart, the heart. Above all else, what are we supposed to guard? Our hearts. Proverbs 4.23, for the three of you that knew that. So above all else, guard your heart, okay? Let's make our hearts Christ's home. We just go through that over and over and over. We're not going to be able to plumb the depths. It's part of salvation, right? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your what? Heart. All right, we got almost everybody. That God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, Okay, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Okay, so over and over and over the heart. Joel 2, 12, God says, give me your hearts. He makes us a promise. He says, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. All right, now we're 100%. Jeremiah 29, 13. Okay, so over and over and over. These are the things we're going to be looking at. And we're not even going to be able to, to plumb the depths of that. There's so much. Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. That's in Matthew 15, 8, quoting Isaiah. And then the scary one, this one always brings me up short, <laughs> out of the overflow of your what? Heart, your mouth speaks. That's a scary one, isn't it? But the thing is, what are we going to do with conviction? If you feel conviction here, know that I've gone through it first, okay? We get convicted because God's word has to go through us, but then he brings us to forgiveness and repentance, and it's such a beautiful thing, it's worth going through the conviction. Okay, so out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's Matthew 12, 34. So we'll be looking at all these things. The heart in the Bible, it's not a muscle pumping blood, okay? It's the control center. It's your motivational headquarters. It's your I want center, okay? And just listen to these things. This is what your heart contains. And I think, as I saw, you're going, wow, this, is, this nails it. Your heart contains your core desires, your need for love, your need for acceptance, significance, and purpose. Your heart contains your core desires. It's the place of current deliberations. Should I do this or not? Should I let this person in or not? And it's the seat of critical decisions. 
that affects our lives for years to come or our whole lives. So it contains our core desires, current deliberations, and critical decisions. And there's a lot of bad habits of the heart. Jesus talks about them in Mark 7, 21. Jeez, these are the words of Christ. From within, out of the heart of man and woman, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from the heart. So how do we get this cleaned up? How do we get to pure hearts? Remember uh, Matthew 5.8 in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. All of us want to see God. So how do we get there? Part of it's awareness. And we're going to talk about that it's a daily discipline to put God first and make our hearts right. Passage after passage after passage, book after book after book, talks about how much God loves you. And those are my favorite lessons to teach and hear because everybody's not, oh yeah, I, we all need to hear how much God loves us. Over and over and over, the word in the Old Testament, it's hesed, it's H-E-C-E-D, it's about his steadfast love. Remember his steadfast love, hesed, it talks about his grace and his love. That's in there over 200 times. Just steadfast love, how very much God loves you. And he does. In the New Testament, in the verse pretty much everyone knows, for God so loved the world, he gave his son, right? Love gives, John 3, 16. And then we go to Romans 5, starting in verse 6. Um, over and over and over, God's love for us, God's love for us, God's love for us. Starting in Romans, well, I'll start with uh, verse 5 of chapter 5. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Think about this. This ought to stop us in our tracks. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one might die. But God showed his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's great love, isn't it? He didn't wait for us to get cleaned up. He died for us first. So we've got this great God that loves us so much. Alan Shepard the astronaut, he was standing on the moon and he looked down at the earth. And this guy, if you look, look up Alan Shepard, astronaut, he gives all these quotes. But he was looking down at the earth and somebody, when he landed, you know, got back, he said, what were you thinking as you looked down? And he said, you know, what I was thinking was very sobering. My ride home was, is being provided by the lowest bidder on a government contract, okay? <laughs> My ride back to earth has been provided by the lowest bidder in a government contract. Ladies, your ride back home to heaven has been provided by the highest bidder. Look what he did for us. While we were still sinners, the highest bidder gave his life for you. That's how much you are loved. And what's so cool now, does anybody agree that our world seems to be getting darker? And if not, you need to talk to me after and we'll talk about where your, your head is. But our world's getting darker, right? So look what God did. He sent the light. James, or John 1, 5, he sent the light. And I love this illustration. It's kind of haunting, but it shows what God did for us. True story, Dr. Robert Sumner, he tells of an unusual grave in West Texas. It's still there today. It has a little window where you can see all the way down to the casket, which is six feet under. Sunlight makes its way down each day. It's the grave of a little 10-year-old boy who on his deathbed said, Daddy, when I die, don't leave me in the dark. Daddy, when I die, don't leave me in the dark. Promise you won't leave me in the dark. Your daddy did not leave you in the dark. He sent his son as the light of the world. We are not in the dark. Yeah, it may look like darkness is closing in, but we've got Jesus Christ, okay? And he's never gonna leave us. He's never gonna forsake us. So we have this, we're dearly loved, I love that. Colossians 3.12 says you are holy and dearly loved. When you're having a tough day, you open up to Colossians 3.12 and sit there and be holy and dearly loved. That's what God's calling you. That's what Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Listen, girl, you're holy. You're dearly loved. It doesn't matter what you feel like. Feelings are liars, okay? Feelings are, have your feelings ever gotten you in a tad of trouble? Just a little? Mine have. Feelings can be liars, but God's love for you is real. It's this great love. But how about your love for him? 
And this is where we need to be honest. Is your love for him always sky high? Always steadfast? Always where it should be? I know as I've gone through this study, I've gotten convicted that mine's not always. Not always loving God with my whole heart. We will not be able to do it perfectly here in these unredeemed bodies. Someday in heaven, when we're face to face with Jesus, but let's strive for that perfect love. Loving the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Like it says in Deuteronomy 6, 5 and 6, and then, as I mentioned, Matthew 22, 37 and 38. But what does it look like? It's a practical class. What does it look like to love God with all our hearts? And for the skeptics around us, why should we? Okay? Do you love God with all your heart? There are those that need a heart transplant. That's what Ezekiel 36, 26 that I mentioned looks like. God takes out our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. But other people, there's those that have received a new heart but have poor circulation. Okay? Sin clogs our arteries. Okay? Sin clogs our arteries. And sometimes we leave our first love. Remember, that's what Jesus said to Ephesus in their letter. He goes through, he says, you know, you're a really good church. You've got good programs, you do good stuff, you're really good, but this is what I have against you. Revelation 2.4, he says, you've left your first love. That's the first letter to the churches. And if you look up, it'll say, well, Paul did the seven letters to the churches on the way of a postal route and everything. God, doesn't, God does everything for a reason. He could have reversed the postal route and have the letter to the Ephesians be last. But no, he put the charge of you have left your first love first. Have you left your first love? That feeling? And he tells us how to get it back. But again, let's just be honest. Because please get this, if nothing else. God cannot bless and forgive who you pretend to be. Listen to that again. God cannot bless and forgive who you are pretending to be. All right? So if we're leaving our first love, why? Why? Sin, for one reason. Two is distraction. The world is full of them. It, it, fortunately, it's been gone for a while now. Did anybody remember that show on Fox called Temptation Island? They took these four unmarried couples that were shacking up, and they went to an island in the Caribbean, and they had these other people who came in to try to tempt them to break them up. Fortunately, it was a short-lived show. But <laughs> Temptation Island? Ladies, we live on Temptation Planet right? It's everywhere. Temptation everywhere. Want a graphic example? Really, just think about it. Where are people's eyes most times now? Down looking at what? Their phones. Their phones. It's scary, isn't it? You just do a sample size. You'll see I'm not lying. Down here. I saw a kid walking to the high school this morning. What, what if somebody comes up behind you? What if a dog comes out? You're, you're this. You're sucked in by that. That eyes are down. Eyes aren't looking up. And then people think Jesus is like some kind of app. Oh, I need Jesus? Okay, where do I find him? Yeah. All right? Jesus isn't an add-on to your life. Jesus is supposed to be our life. So what's taken us away from our first love? Sin, distraction. Busy, busy, busy. Okay? Busy, busy, busy. It's easy to get too busy. It's easy to get too busy in ministry. Remember Martha Stewart and Mary? Right? Martha Stewart's running around, need to feed the disciples, they're men, they're hungry, they're always hungry. Okay? Where was Mary? The feet of Jesus. And remember, remember what Jesus said? She chose the better way. The better way. Okay? This study has made me put a rocking chair in my office. I feel like I'm 90 when I go, but if I sit in that rocking chair, this is my time. I'm not moving, Lord. I want to just focus on you. Okay? Just focus on you. He said, that's the better way at his feet. Why do we leave our first love Satan? Satan wants to destroy your relationship with Jesus. He's come to kill and steal and destroy. He wants to keep you away from Jesus. And number five, let's just be really honest. Why do we leave our first love? It's hard. It is hard. Drift is easy, right? Drift is easy. You get in a boat out on Lake Tahoe, you're going to drift like crazy. Even if the wind's not that much, drift is easy. Being intentional is hard. Being intentional is hard, but being intentional is so worth it. So worth it. Why should we love Jesus with all of our heart, souls, mind, and strength? Well, let me just give you a very practical thing first, and then I'm going to give you several reasons. But they fell out of my notes. This is really good. 
There they are. Okay, but I, I want to hit this first one first. Jesus loves you. Talked about that. Jesus died for you. Anybody else die for you? Jesus died for you. So that's why we should love him first. You need to hold fast to the one who loves you first, to the one who loves you best, to the one who died for you. Two choices, ladies. You can hold fast to Jesus Christ or you can hold fast to this melting popsicle that is our world. Look at that imagery, and it's not a climate change thing, okay? Our world is like a melting popsicle right now. We are devolving. If you don't believe me, again, my words don't mean anything. Read Romans 1, 18 to 32, and tell me that's not happening right now. People are debasing their bodies. People are debasing their minds. And we celebrate it. My little joke about Pride Week when we're in it, we're in real Pride Week, like the sin that we want to get past. My gosh, we celebrate perversity now. We celebrate home, just all these things that we shouldn't be doing. And we approve and we celebrate, okay? Don't hang on to the melting popsicle that is this world. Why you should love Jesus. Number one, he changed your final destination. He changed your final destination. I love Ephesians 2.1. I love Paul because Paul's just so direct. He can be snarky. He's just a really cool guy. He can be sarcastic. But in Ephesians 2.1, he doesn't pull any punches. You know this verse. He says, you were dead in the sins and trespasses in which you once walked. You were dead. You were a dead woman walking. The walking dead. You were dead. Following the course of this world, which is what we're talking about, running after the melting popsicle. Following the prince of the power of the air, Satan. The spirit now at work in the sons of disobedience. And then it's all of us. We can't point fingers. You know, we're supposed to be the body of Christ, not the finger of accusation, okay? We're the body of Christ, not the finger of accusation, among whom we all once lived. All. All means all. In Hebrew and Greek, we all live there, carrying out the passions of our flesh, the desires of the body and mind. This is so scary. We were by nature children of wrath. Look what happened to Jesus on that cross when God poured his wrath out. Could you have handled it? Could I? I think about Jesus getting flogged. And remember, they take those, those whips of leather and they put spikes in them they put pieces of rock in them and they'd hit his back and rip the flesh off and he got 40 of those. I couldn't have taken one. Could you? And that's what he did for us to take God's wrath instead of us taking it because we were children of wrath and that ought to send a huge pit into our stomachs. But then there's always buts in the Bible and this is an awesome but. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us. Even when we are dead, he made us alive together with Christ. God has changed your final destination. Look at that, from a child of wrath taking the full vent of God's punishment to being his kid. And you know that what's so cool, this isn't a back-of-the-bus salvation. This isn't a second-class citizen thing because rich in mercy, because of his great love, he made us alive with Christ and he raised you up. This isn't a begrudging thing. Oh, I'm stuck with you. This is he raised you up and seated you with Jesus in the heavenly places. And he's made you a masterpiece. When you go all, you, we could spend this whole time and next week and next week just in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. This is what he did for you. This is who you are. Is he not worthy of being your first love? Made you his kid. He made you his kid. John 1, 12. To as many as received him, to as many who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This is a little embarrassing, but I think you need to know. So maybe beginning of June, I don't know, first thing in the morning I get up and I'm out scooping dog poop in the backyard because that's what people do. So out there, three dogs, so out there in the backyard, and I truly had just gotten up. I am in, we have a privacy fence, so I thought I was good. Um, so six foot wooden privacy fence, so I've, night shirt, shorts, my legs ain't great anymore, believe me, hitting 60 here. So nightshirt, shorts, bedhead, glasses, no contacts, morning breath. The, the, the dog poop bag here, getting full, and we use a plastic glove, so it was quite a sight. And I'm there bending over, scooping poop, and I hear, good morning. I'm not kidding. And I went, 
okay, the dogs weren't going nuts. I'm going, I don't see anybody else in the backyard, okay. Then I thought, oh, whoever that, they're not even talking to me. It must be someone on the other side of the fence having a conversation. And then I hear it again, good morning. And then I went, I wonder if it's God. And then, but that's just not how I imagined. I mean, God would be a good morning, you know. And I thought, oh my gosh. And I look up, airplanes, airplane girl, okay. Husband flies airplanes, son flies airplanes, I fixed airplanes, all this. So airplanes have rules of how high you can go over structures. I found out that morning, air balloons do not. So I look. And this guy's hanging like right on our roof. And, and we have like most of our house is one story and then there's another part that's two story. But no, no, no. He's over the one story. He's almost touching our roof. And, and I look up and I'm just like, oh my gosh. Talk about seeing somebody at their worst. And, and I mean, now the dogs are going nuts. The great dogs, you know, finally figured out something's up. And I just looked at him and here I am. Morning breath, hair sticking up, contacts, dog poop. And, and I look, I go, you're scaring my dogs. You know, so... <laughs> Um, so he kind of floats away, and then I hear him say to somebody, my mom had a dog like that. I wondered if they thought it was God over there. But I was so mortified that someone saw me like this when I saw, thought I was in the privacy of my backyard. Da, 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 da. But how has God seen me? God saw me covered with filth. God saw you at your worst, covered with sin. And look what he did. He said, I want her to be mine. I want her to be mine to be mine, and to as many as received him, to as many as believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, dearly loved children, not second-class citizens or anything else. But let me tell you this, ladies. You know how we're told to not love the world or the things in the world, right? Because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. That's 1 John 2, 15, 16 right there, okay? Jesus wants a bride, not a prostitute. Process that for a minute. Jesus Christ wants a bride, not a prostitute. Prostitutes run after the next shiny thing, the next shiny this, the next shiny that. He wants a bride, not a prostitute. Remember, he warned the people so much before they went into the promised land, don't go after their gods. Don't go after their gods. You're going to be surrounded with them. Don't marry their, their women. They're going to suck you into it. Solomon, the smartest man in the whole world, suckered into it. He went after the next shiniest thing. There's always going to be another shiny thing. But you have to say, who's my first love? And why is he my first love? Because he saved you, because he loved you, because he shows you grace all the time, because he's seen you at your worst. And you know what? You're never going to hear from him, I don't love you anymore. My husband and I were watching a show the other night, and the, the husband tells the lady he's leaving her. And of course, I threatened Dan. I said, you leave me, you die. But that's an aside. Um, but just, just so he knows where he stands. But so this, this husband says to the lady, I'm leaving you. And she just, you know, she's a good actress. She just looks flabbergasted. And well, why? And he says those words that just rip your heart out. I don't love you anymore. And even though it was a show, I felt so bad for her. Okay, that, those are brutal words. Jesus will never say that to you. Never. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. He's never going to bail on you. Never. He loved you first. First John 4, 19, that's what we're talking about. When you were covered with filth, he loved you first. And you know, God is love. It's his character. He cannot not love you. How's that for some good English? God cannot not love you. First John 4, 8. He can't help himself. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you're... He cannot not love you. This is so cool. Really excited to get to lesson three. I learned so much from it our motives and the motives of our hearts. But you know what? God has no ulterior motive. Can you point to anybody else in your life and say that person has pure motives? Even if they want to, even if they're a really godly person, we're still in these unredeemed bodies. We need to make sure our motives are pure. God doesn't need to. God has no ulterior motive. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him or are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. In all things, he works for the good. There's no ulterior motive with God. He walks through the fire with you. We're going there in just a minute to Daniel 3. And every good and perfect gift from, comes from God. That's James 1.17. Loving him and loving him first is intentional. Think about it. At Christmas, we sing, oh, come let us adore him. We shouldn't just be singing at Christmas. We should adore him in the manger, 
for coming to earth for us. We should adore him on his throne. Read Revelation 4 and 5 and look at God on his throne and the splendor and the majesty of that and then adore him on that cross. We should be adoring him all the time intentionally. When I get up in the morning and it's just my thing, but I get up and I say, I love you, Father God. And I say, I love you, Jesus, my Lord and Savior. And I love you, Holy Spirit, my leader and guide. And yes, I understand three and one and all that, but when you break it down intentionally like that, you then think about each step of the way. Your father's holding you close on his lap. He's got his arms around you. Okay, there's this uh, foster family up in Carson and they get new babies all the time. And I've noticed whenever they get a new baby, they hold that baby and they just say, you're safe, you're safe. That baby can't understand the words that baby's being told already, you are safe in my arms. That is what God says to you. You're safe. So we adore him all over. The manger, the throne, the foot of the cross, and we acknowledge it. Daniel 3. I'm just going to use a couple um, stories you know, but we're going to bring the, the points out of them. You remember Daniel 3 is the fiery furnace story, okay? And this is what we're going to be talking about being daily and being t- intentional Daniel fell out of my Bible. There he is. Okay. We're going to talk about being intentional daily, daily, daily. Just think about these guys for a minute. It's about 600 BC. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, we're going to talk about him during Pride Week. Not a good guy. Well, he kind of went back and forth, but not good here. So what Nebuchadnezzar did was when he invaded and conquered the known world, kind of think of him like an Alexander the Great, okay? Conquered the known world, but what he would do, he would take the best and the brightest out with him. Remember Daniel chapter one? He would go in and he took Daniel and Shadrach, Medna- whatever his name, Medrach and Abednego. I knew it this morning. All right, but he went in and he, he took them, okay? We'll do better. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all right? So he brings them back to his land. He wanted the best and the brightest. He took them from their homes, their families, their friends, the only culture they had known, but he did not take them from their God, okay? Did not take them from their God. So they go into this foreign land, and if you read Daniel chapter 1 later, you'll see the king said, ah, these guys are looking good. I'm going to feed them like I eat, I'm going to take good care of these captives. I'm going to feed them like I eat. And Daniel politely, respectfully went to him and said, can we, we don't want to defile ourselves with our king's food, with the king's food. That was his, their, his idea. And so he said, could we please just eat vegetables? And for, I mean, who wants to? But I guess it was what was better. And it is better. So he went and he asked the king, can we just eat vegetables? And in 10 days, just see who looks better, us or these guys eating your diet. And of course, they look better because God was with Daniel. But look at that. He, they didn't compromise on the little things, on the big things. They were in the world, but not of the world. This is an example in the Old Testament. They were living in the world, in Babylon, but they were not of the world. They said, we don't want to eat this. Okay? Then the time comes, these daily habits, acknowledging God, praying to God, you are my God. I am deciding in advance, I am bowing down to you. Then you get to Daniel chapter 3, and remember what happens, Nebuchadnezzar makes this huge statue, huge statue. And he said, whenever the band plays, and he goes through great lengths to tell us all the instruments, whenever the band plays, you need to bow down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego aren't bowing down. No way. You know why they weren't bowing down? Because they were already bowed down to their God. Please look at the significance for today. Persecution against Christians is building, right? Across the world, much worse than us, but even in our own country, persecution's building. We could end up seeing the Antichrist and see what the mark of the beast looks like. I don't know how it's all, okay? We could see those things in our lifetime. I don't know, but you don't have to worry about it. I've had ladies come and, what if I take the mark of the beast by accident? Like, honey, you can't do it by accident. You read the scriptures, it's a choice. They chose to take the mark. Okay, but think about this. You don't have to worry about what's to come and bowing down if you're already bowing down. You bow down to Jesus Christ right now, and you don't have to worry about what's to come. You're already bowed down. And that's what happened with these guys. A word you could use, it's probably not great English, but the way I was thinking, they pre-decided. They pre-decided, I am never bowing down to anyone except the true God. Think about the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, starting in verse, you shall have no other gods before me. It says right in there, you shall not bow down. You shall not make yourself an idol. They pre-decided not to do it. 
So what happens? Nebuchadnezzar says, you need to bow down. They predecided, we're not bowing down. So he gets enraged, and he's going to throw them in the fiery furnace. And he says in Daniel 3, verse 15, and who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? He's challenging them. Just a thought. You don't challenge the true God. Just like when over and over and over, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. You don't want to oppose the true God, okay? You don't stand a chance. But, he's, but, but Nebuchadnezzar, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Polite, respectful, O king, but we have no need to answer you because we're already bowed down. We're already bowed down. And I love verse 17. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery service, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Let's break that down. Those are hard times. They just professed even if love. If Jesus Christ is your first love, if God is your first love, it has to be an even if love. Even if he doesn't do things your way, okay? They professed even if. And, and the hard part of it is, is he's able. They said God's able. Isn't it hard when you go, know that God is able to do something and he doesn't do it? You know God's able to heal that person you love and he doesn't do it? Or you pray that this person doesn't die and he dies and you knew God was able to stop it? Those are hard times. But that's the kind of love we need to have for our first love, this even if love. Because really, if you keep the long perspective, if you keep the eternal perspective, you're gonna win either way. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Okay, that's Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. So we have this ultimate victory. So if you know Christ and you're sick and God heals you, that's wonderful. And if you die and get to go be with Jesus, boy, is that wonderful too. Okay, the long view, the eternal view that we always have to hang on to, they did. If God is able, he's able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we still love him. They profess that even if love. And that's what we need to have for our first love. He's always with you. And you may think, yeah, right, all the time? Yeah, all the time. This one, think about Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, verse 1, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. Through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. Ladies, we're supposed to be overcomers, not the overwhelmed. Okay? Let's be overcomers, not the overwhelmed. They shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. Look at this. They heated up that furnace to seven times. They wanted them fried to a crisp. God didn't let the fire touch them, but it burned up the guys who threw them in. Okay? Right here. You shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. So they leaned on God's word. And we know the story. They came out of it not even singed. They didn't even smell like smoke. Our God is completely able to deliver, whether it's here on earth or in heaven. And they understood that. We need to cling to our first love like that and acknowledge that I want your will, whatever it is, I will love you no matter what. I will love you even if. They worship their way in, and they worship their way out. Think about that. They worship their way in. That's what got them in trouble. They refused to bow down. They were worshiping the true God. So they worship their way into trouble. They worship their way out of trouble when they made that declaration. You're my God, even if you don't do things my way. You're my God, even if you don't do things my way. They worship their way in. They worship their way out of trouble. They didn't have a motive. They just to chose to trust the even if love. There's a lady in the Bible, and the King James Version uh, lays this out better. It's Matthew 20, verse 20 and 21. Remember Zebedee's sons, James and John? They had kind of a helicopter mom. So... So this woman goes before Jesus and it said she worshiped him and she wanted something. This isn't even if love. 
She worshipped him, and she wanted something. So she, she worships, and then she said, I'd like one of my sons to sit on your left and one of my sons to sit on your right. No ulterior motive. We don't worship because we want something. We worship because we love God and we trust him even if we keep him our first love. Just a great example of living in the world but not of the world. Jesus talked about that in, uh, Matt, or I'm sorry, John 15, 19. We want that consistency of behavior. Consistency of behavior. No ulterior motive. <laughs> but what if I don't have that kind of love for God? H- how do you get it? Can't manufacture it. How do you get it? One word that'll help, I think, is when you say remember. Remember. Remember the days of long ago. Meditate on all his works and consider what God's hands have done. That's Psalm 143, 5. Remember. Psalm 103, verse 2, puts it in the other aspect. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Remember what he's done for you. Right there, we talked about the letter to Ephesus. You've left your first love. What's the first thing Jesus himself tells him, them to do? Remember. Remember. Repent. Do what you did at first. Okay, we need to go back and remember what God has done for us. And we need to give thanks. A love that keeps God first is saturated with thanksgiving. Do you thank God for the drink of water you just had? He provided you that water. Are you thanking God for the air you breathe? It's that basic. He's giving us everything. What do we have that he hasn't given us? 2 Corinthians 4, around verse 5 or 7. What do we have that God has not given us? We need to be saturated with thanksgiving. Augustine said a Christian ought to be a walking hallelujah. We should be walking hallelujahs. I praise you, God. I thank you, God. It, it's so sad the way we get sometimes. We just use people. We have ulterior motives, like we mentioned James and John's mom. There's a, in the middle of President Lincoln's pres- presidency, an elderly lady made an appointment to see him. She entered his office, and he inquired, how can I be of service to you, madam? The lady answered, Mr. President, I know you're a very busy man. I haven't come to ask you for anything. I just came to bring you some cookies. There was a long silence, and he started to cry. Right there in his office, he said, Madam, I'm greatly moved by what you've done. Since I became president, people have come into this office one after another asking for favors and demanding things from me. You're the first person who's ever entered these premises asking no favor but bringing a gift. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You know people like that. The only time they talk to you is when they want something, right? And you're standing there going, oh, here she comes. What what she wants this time? Let's just be honest about it, right? Do you want God to look at us that? Well, here she comes. wonder what the problem is this time, even though he knows. Okay, don't make it like that. Fellowship with God every single day. Eugene Peterson, I found something about six months that he had written about three language stages. And I want to share it with you because, boy, it has changed my prayer life. He said there's, there's three language stages, and this isn't like a thing you're going to see in a child developmental manual or anything, but boy, as I've been doing this, it really hit home. He said the first language is when we're born. It's the language of intimacy. Words are not nearly as important as communion and fellowship. That's language one. It's relationship-oriented. It's also the language of spiritual intimacy. We're not concerned about context, content, motivation. It's all about fellowship and responsiveness. So I read this about six months ago, and then about six months ago, my um, youngest grandson, Timothy, was born. So Timothy became the guinea pig on this. So Timothy and I, I get to see him every month, was there when he was born. We practice language one. Okay, don't mention to my daughter-in-law, Katie, I called her son a guinea pig, but it's worked for me. Okay, so Timothy, he just, he doesn't know any words. And and so I said, I just would hold him, and I'd look at him. And he'd look at me. And he'd watch my eyes and my mouth to see what it, it was just, he had my full attention. And I had his, just holding him, loving on him. And then pretty soon you start doing all the stupid things you do with babies to get them to smile, right? And you say stupid words that aren't even words. You make sounds and, and you, you smile and you do all this. I mean, I, I'm overjoyed when he throws up in my hair. He's a spitter. But it's just, it's just this fellowship. It's your full attention. Words don't matter. It's you and him. That's language one with God. It's just you and him. And words don't even matter because sometimes you're hurting so bad you don't even know what to say. And then other times you're so overjoyed you don't know what to say. 
And still other times you just don't know what to say. So just this fellowship, this communion with God. And you'll understand it better when we get to language two. Language two, they hit, what, around nine, ten months where they start information. It's ball, nose, eye, mama, dada. It's, it's, it's information, right, in stage two, conveying information. And then in stage three, that's the motivation stage, year, year and a half, when it gets to be, I want milk, I want the ball. It's, 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 it's motivation stage. Huh. Where do you spend the majority of your prayer time? That's what pulled me up short. When I said, okay, what stage do I spend the majority of my time with God in? Language one, just fellowshipping with him, just, just, just giving him my full attention because I know I have his, or am I in language two? You know, God, this is what you need to know about this person, and you need to fix her, and you need to fix him. And then language three, when it's all about motivating God to do what you want, does anybody else pray according to God's will but then tell him what it should be? You know, you, you go through and you tell God all the stuff he should do and then you go, but I'm asking for your will, Lord. Well, did you really need to go through all this stuff in the beginning? But think about where you're spending your prayer time. And prayer time should be all the time, okay? Because you know what? If you're not praying, don't just, I was busy, I was this. You know what? If you're not praying, you need to check some pride. Do you think you don't need him? Do you think you don't need to be talking to God all the time? So where is it? Is it in fellowship, just loving on him? Or is it information? Or is it trying to motivate him to do what you want? It was quite eye-opening for some. Let's show you what it looks like. I'm going to Luke 7, verse 36. But this was really cool. This was in a, a science fiction book written by Robert Sawyer. In all of his books, he has a page or two with a subplot that has a profound spiritual insight in one of his books, people from Earth are having their first encounter with an alien life form. One of the scientists is surprised to learn that aliens not only believe in God, but they spend eight hours a day in prayer. The scientist questioned him, what in the world are you asking for that takes eight hours? The alien is shocked and says, what does prayer have to do with asking for things? They got language one. Okay, just that fellowship. Oh, oh come let us adore him. You know, and he, and he tells us to sing a new song. Over and over. Do you realize how many times it is in Scripture? Psalm 144.9, sing a new song. Psalm 33.3, sing a new song. Psalm 96.1, a new song. Think God's trying to tell us something? Psalm 98.1, a new song. Psalm 149.1, a new song. Isaiah 42.10, a new song. He doesn't want to hear the same old stuff. Okay, he wants a new song. He wants to be part of your day today. That's why we're doing this daily, intentional, acknowledging God. Okay? Daily, intentional, acknowledging God. I love you. I need you. A new song every day. This is what's facing me today, Lord. These are what I'm worried about today. This is just going before him. This is what I need your help with today. Because you know what? You're supposed to be singing a new song. He's singing over you. Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is in your midst a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Loud singing. He's so thrilled to be with you, he's singing loud. Okay, that's Zephaniah 317. Sing him a new song. Let's look at a very intimate example of what that looks like. You know the story again, but let's apply it with what we're looking at. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. So, Jesus was invited to the home of Simon. There's different uh, versions, but we're using the one in Luke 7, verse 36. One of the, si Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus to come to his home for dinner. What they would do those days, um, if it, either inside, if they had a large home, or outside in the courtyard, the invited guests would come sit at the table, like Jesus, and then people from the town could come and watch and listen. Okay, so they, they weren't invited to the meal, but they could ring on the outside and watch and listen. Okay, they didn't have news then. They didn't have satellite. This is how they listened to teachers. This is how they found out what's going on. But they would come gather around. And, and as we know, because you know the story, Simon didn't offer Jesus even the most basic of a courtesy. Okay, when you went into someone's home in those days as a sign of fellowship, because remember, fellowship, you're under my roof. I will take care of you. I'm responsible. He didn't give him the kiss of fellowship. They used to offer water as you know, because they walked in sandals on dusty streets where animals walk too. So they'd offer water. They'd offer oil on the head, and it's just very dry, arid climate. It was like a moisturizer. 
Simon didn't do any of these things. Total disrespect. I invite you, but I'm going to be rude to you. I'm going to show everybody how rude I'm going to be to you. But then here comes this woman. She brings her alabaster flask, and she's standing behind Jesus at his feet, weeping. She begins to wet his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Simon wants to debate with Jesus because he's all into religion. This woman's relationship. She is at the feet of Christ. She never leaves his feet. And, you know, I started thinking about it in relation to the cross. She, what's she doing? She's kissing his feet. She's pouring her heart water, her tears, on his feet. She's drying his feet with her hair. Jewish women would not let their hair down except in front of their husband. That was a disgrace. She's doing all these things at his feet. Have you ever thought about what Jesus' feet did for us? The blood that came from those feet when the spike went in, that cleansed you. That opened the way to heaven for you. You are covered in his blood. That's what made us righteous. So she's kneeling at these feet, and what came out of that feet, those feet, saved her. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sin. That's Hebrews 9.22. So she is at the feet of the one who saves her. And she's just pouring her love out on him. And, and just look at the chance she took. You know, when it says a sinful woman, that's kind of like a euphemism. She was a prostitute. She was a prostitute. So she didn't care about the humiliation, though. She's going to this dinner with all the Pharisees, who are the righteous ones, who follow all the rules. You know, if, if heaven was about rules and a checklist, they'd be first in line. But that was religion, not relationship. So she's walking into the room. They were so respected. We look at the Pharisees. We read Matthew 23 and goes, Jesus wasn't happy with those guys. Okay, he, whoa, 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 seven times to the Pharisees. But they were respected in their day. They were the ones that uphold the law. God's really got to love them. So she walks into this, this prostitute. But she didn't care about them. She didn't care about what they said. She didn't care if they tried to humiliate her. She got at the feet of her Savior. Language one, she never says a word. Look at language one right here. It's fellowship. It's communion. It's I'm pouring this out on you. I love you. And you know, I thought a lot about that because it says right here too, she didn't do this to be forgiven. When you go to verse 47, verse 47, when Jesus is talking to Simon and having to connect the dots because the guy can't do it himself, he said, therefore I tell you, her, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. In Greek, that's past tense. Jesus said she stands forgiven. She wasn't forgiven because of what she did. She was forgiven when she came in. Whether it was another encounter with Jesus, whether she heard him say, come to, you, come to me. All you are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Whatever it was. She, was, she didn't do this to be forgiven. She did this because she was forgiven. And she's pouring her love out on him. Language one. And, and so I was thinking, what does that look like for us? What does it look like? She just wanted his presence. Fellowship. She risked humiliation. She wanted relationship. Augustine, my heart is restless until I find my rest in thee. Is God calling us to be like this woman? Is he calling us to manufacture something? To manufacture feelings? That's not at all it. Is our goal simply to feel what she felt? That's not it either. There's something too personal here to try to copy too personal to try to copy because you are you and God made you uniquely. This is too personal to copy. Each of us has a different heart and a different personality. So it's no value to try to follow somebody else's walk, to follow somebody else's relationship with the Lord. God loves you and he wants a relationship with you, not what it looks like for other people. Remember, I said God can't forgive and bless who you're pretending to be. He wants the real you. And don't sit here and say, the real me is ugly. He knows. Okay, he knows. He knows everything. It's sobering. He knows everything. He loves you and he wants you, not an imitation of someone else. She shows a heart whose love knows what ultimate love is worth. She's living in awareness of being forgiven. The, the pain of what she's done, knowing somebody's going to have to bear the cost for what she did, and the deep gratitude that can't find words to express her thankfulness. She showed the deep gratitude 
that didn't even have words to express her thankfulness. It's coming back to our first love. And as I was saying, there are different ways. What does it look like? Uh, Gary Thomas wrote a book called Sacred Pathways. Um, I don't recommend a book until I read every word. His book, Sacred Marriage, is phenomenal. His book, When to Walk Away, is phenomenal. I didn't read all of Sacred Pathways, but I did have this illustration because I think it helps. He said, naturalists are most inspired to find God outdoors as they enjoy his creation. That's not the guy who doesn't go to the church because he's on the golf course worshiping, okay? But people who enjoy the outside, that's a way of bringing you into worship. A sensate loves God with their senses, okay? Whether that's appreciating a beautiful worship service or that, that just involves sight and smell and, and touch, just, just the beauty of that. Traditionalists draw closer to God through rituals. It's not about going through the motions. It, it's enjoying God in each part of the ritual. I have a, a son who uh, is a pastor, and he, um, he should have been in the Puritan age. He loves the tradition because he likes to go through it. He loves the Lord's Supper because he puts himself there and goes through each step of what happened and what it looked like. He loves public confession in, in church like some churches do because he, he just thinks about what that means and how you're cleansed. Traditionalists, ascetics love God in solitude, in simplicity, just being alone with him. Activists love God through confronting evil, battling injustice, working to make the world a better place. Caregivers love God by serving others and meeting their needs. Enthusiasts love God through celebration. Contemplatives love God through adoration. Intellectuals come to God by studying. It's just all, whatever your personality looks like, give him the best of you all the time. The best of you and first of you. You find time to do what you love, bottom line. You can say I'm too busy, but we find time to do what we love. And we have to have this worship, this love expressed through worship. Worship is saying you are worthy. Your first love is worthy. Okay, that's what worship is. I love this picture. Not long ago, it said the world watched as three gray whales. They were icebound off of Point Barrow, Alaska. They floated battered and bloody, grasping for breath at a hole in the ice. Their only hope was somehow to be transported five miles past the ice pack to the open sea. So rescuers began cutting a string of breathing holes about 20 yards apart in the six-inch thick ice so that the whales could get to the open sea. For eight days, they coaxed the whales from one hole to the next, mile after mile. Along the way, one of the trio vanished and was presumed dead. But finally, with the help of two Russian icebreakers, two of the whales swam to freedom. In a way, listen to this, Worship is a string of breathing holes that the Lord provides his people. Worship is a string of breathing holes that God provides his people. Every day, you are worthy. Let me breathe you in. Step after step after step. We're battered and bruised in a world frozen over with greed and selfishness and hatred, and we rise for air when we worship the Lord until the day when the Lord forever shatters the ice cap. Look at that imagery. We'll be worshiping all the time in heaven. But for here, go up for those breathing holes. Go meet the one that loves you best. I'm just going to give you one more example of love. I'm just going to confess something to you right now. Peter is my Bible boyfriend, okay? Peter's my Bible boyfriend because Peter always talks. Just, it just flies out, doesn't it? He loves Jesus, but the guy doesn't follow James being quick to listen, slow to speak slow to become angry. Peter just charges in, okay? Peter just charges in. I, I love the guy. I really do. And, and for good and bad, you know, Peter's a one-step forward, two-step back kind of guy too. Remember, they're standing in Caesarea Philippi, and Caesarea Philippi had these, these uh, mountains, hills all around them, and they had idols. They had statues to idols. They had poles. They just had all this stuff full of idols. And Jesus looks, and he says, who do you say I am? Who do people say I am? And so the other disciples, oh, some think you're John the Baptist, some think you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. This is who they think you are. But then Jesus, of course, goes in for the most important question, asking every one of us, who do you say I am? And Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. A plus, A plus, you are the Christ. G Peter knew who Jesus was. He, he gets the gold star. And, and Jesus just, that was awesome, Peter. You didn't come up with that yourself. God showed you, Peter. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And Peter was awesome. 
And then so Jesus continues on and says, you know, I'm going to be crucified and died and buried. And Peter rebukes Jesus. Peter tells God he's wrong. Bad. Bad. Peter rebukes Jesus, right? And what does Jesus say to, to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Because Peter, who had just gotten the A+, plus, who just nailed it, got 100 on the final exam, then he goes and he lets Satan use his mouth and says, no, no, you can't go to the cross because Satan knew the cross was going to free us, right? Satan knew the cross was going to save us. So, no, no, and, and so Jesus rebukes Peter, okay? And then we know what Peter did. Peter, full of pride and presumption, tells Jesus that even if everybody else denies you, I won't. Pride and presumption, okay? Even if everybody else does this. So then... John 21, there they are, after Jesus has been crucified and died and rose again. We see Jesus and Peter and the other disciples in John 21, and Jesus makes them breakfast. Peter can't wait to get to Jesus. They're out there fishing. He'd gone back to what he always did. They're out there fishing, and Jesus makes breakfast, and, and you know it says he made it on a charcoal fire. Do you remember what kind of fire it was when, Jesus, or when Peter denied Jesus with the servant girl? a charcoal fire. You know how your olfactory nerve is collect, connected to your memory center? How smells can trigger memories? What do you think Peter was thinking? When he smelled that charcoal on the bank, what was he remembering? The last time he smelled charcoal, when he said, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him. But yet here we are on the bank. Peter couldn't wait to get to him. He jumps out of the boat, swims there in his clothes, gets there, they have breakfast, and Jesus says, Simon, son of John, this is uh, chapter 21, verse 15, do you love me more than these? This is so cool. Don't miss this. Do you love me more than these? In Greek, I only know a tiny bit, but I study a lot and do a lot of research. That these is ambiguous. The smartest Greek scholar doesn't really know what these Jesus was referring to. Peter, do you love me more than these? Was Jesus saying, Peter, do you love me more than you love these disciples, these other guys? He was saying, Peter, do you love me more than these guys love me? Peter, do you love me more than these, this life which you've returned to, being back out on the water and fishing where I found you? So do you love me more than you love the other disciples? Do you love me more than the other disciples love me? Do you love me more than this life? Do you love me more than these? Jesus asks every single one of us this question because we all have a different these. Do you love me more than these, Mary? Do you love me more than these, Sue? Do you love me more than these, Sherry? Do you love me more than these? What's your these? Your family? Your health? Your, population, or your popularity? Your home? Your stuff? Do you love me more than these? And the answer is, if we're loving Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and going back to our first love, it doesn't matter what the these is. That's why I just think God in his wisdom made it ambiguous because it's different. We've been saying, you're all different. We're all different. The way we connect with God is different. The way we fellowship with God is different. Do you love me more than these? Whatever you're these, the answer needs to be yes. And he asks him again. But this time, do you love me? And again, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he asked him three times. But the first one, do you love me more than these? When you lay in bed tonight, ask God to show you. When you walk out the door, show me. Is there a these that I'm loving more than you? Lord, I want you to be my first love. I want you to have first place in my heart. Daily acknowledgement. Acknowledgement, number one, apart from God, you can do nothing. Those are Jesus' words in John 15, 5. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You know what? Apart from him, you know nothing. Right? Apart from him, you know nothing. That's because God is the beginning of all wisdom and knowledge. Start right in chapter 1 of Proverbs. Apart from him, you know nothing. And I always tell God, apart from you, I am nothing. I'm only something because I am made in his image and I'm his child. You are made in his image, and if you accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, you're his child. That's what makes you something. Jesus is the only one that can define you without destroying you. Think that through. He is the only one that can define you without destroying you. If you're defined by your stuff, you're going to be destroyed. If you're defined by your pride and what you take pride in, you're going to be destroyed. Jesus is the only one that can define you. I am his, and he is mine. 
to as many as received him, to as many as believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I'd bring him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what can I give him? Give him my heart. You know, as you think through these stories, the commitment of, of the three guys in the fiery furnace, the lady pouring her heart out on the feet of Jesus, Peter, do you love me more than these? We have things we can work through in each story just a little bit at a time to go, okay, I want my heart to belong to you. What's getting in the way? Okay, you can work through all of those as we go through. Next week, we're going to look at trusting him with all our heart. So if we're making the decision to go all in and love him with all our heart, we're going to see that we can trust him with all of our hearts too. Let's go ahead and pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you are just so awesome and you love us just as we come to you. Lord, I pray that you'll show each one of us how to love you better. Lord, that we will pour our love out on you, whatever that looks like, in different ways, just to show you that you're first. Lord, I pray that if we're loving something else more than you, if there's a these, that you please show us and make us aware of that so we can just come to you so firmly and right and belong to you and pre-decide that we're with you forever. Father, if we've drifted, I pray that we return to our first love. Jesus, thank you for loving us enough to go to the cross. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for the majestic, awesome God you are. We love you, Lord. In your precious name, amen.